welcome back, or if you're new, just welcome. To find the shortest path, we're going to start with a problem. And then we're going to make a few attempts, and they might not work, but they might help us get towards our goal. And then we'll come up with a solution, and I'll give you the code for all the methods. But uh, you might think, why not just jump straight to the solution? And I think that looking at ways that don't work gives you intuition on how the way that does work, works. And the reality is that in life, you won't just be able to jump straight to a solution. You have to try lots of stuff that doesn't work before you get there. And it's that process that's about learning and improving so that when you get to the final goal, you think, ah, oh, I've learned a lot to get here. And it's not just solving a single problem, but everything that you've picked up along the way. I always like to have a problem to solve, and usually that's a real world problem, but uh, I know lots of pure mathematicians like solving problems that have no applications at all in the real world. So in this problem, I want to get from London to Brighton, and I want to take the shortest path. And you might say, oh, that's easy, we just draw a straight line. Or you might say, oh, that's slightly more complicated, but still easy. We just take the arc of a great circle. But uh, no, to make things more difficult, I'm going to try and get there by bike. To make this problem easier, we're going to abstract it. So get rid of lots of the unnecessary information and transport everything into a graph. So by graph, I don't mean the kind of x and y axis and then you plot a function. I mean a structure that shows the relationships between objects. And as you can see, this is how a graph is defined. And mathematically, it's a pair of vertices. So they're the kind of points in your graph and then the edges, which are the connectors between things. So to start, we'll draw a bunch of nodes for our test graph and then we'll add in some edges. And you can see that if we pick two nodes then there might be an edge between them but uh, of course not every two nodes are connected by an edge some are connected indirectly and to make this more useful and more specific to some problems we can then add weights to the edges which might represent how much it costs to uh, build the edge or how long it takes to get from one node to another, or even the distance between two nodes. Now that we've introduced this fairly abstract construct of a graph, you might want to wonder where this is useful in real life. And one great way is through the internet, where you have each device as a node or vertex, and all the edges being the connections between devices, whether that's Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, cables, or whatever. Also in other types of networks, like a water or electricity network, or a social network, or a transport network. And also in, for example, video recommender systems, where you've got two types of nodes, your users and your videos, and the edges are maybe who watched the video, who liked the video, and so on and also in other types of search engines and recommender systems. And another great one, which uh, most people don't think of as a graph, is the brain. You've got all these neurons, and the main bodies of the neurons are connected via edges, which are the axons. And maybe this would help us understand the brain in a better way. And then of course we've got the one which is most relevant to what we're trying to do, and that's roads, where each road is an edge, or each part of a road is an edge, and anywhere where you have a junction or an intersection or a way you can turn off is a node. And uh, while most of the other graphs are constructed by nodes and then the links represent edges, this one's interestingly done by having edges and then the nodes appearing in convenient places. Before we get on to the main problem, we should start with a simpler one, as is always a good case when trying to solve a difficult problem. So to start, we'll just assume that all the edges have a weight of one. And as in our main problem, we're gonna try and get from node A 
to node B, although in this case it's node H. And so we'll start by setting the distances of all the nodes to infinity. And in practice, you just pick a very large number. And this is so that it's always shorter to take a route along the graph than our initial route. So we initialized it was 10, but the shortest path was actually a distance of 12. Then our algorithm would tell us that the distance was 10, which isn't very helpful. And then we'll set the distance for A to be 0. Next, we'll start at A, and uh, we put that in a queue, and then we look at all the neighbours of A, and you can see that's B, D, E, and G, and we now know that the distance to them is exactly 1, and because there are first nodes, there can't be any nodes that are already shorter than those, so we put those in the queue and continue. And so now in our queue, we have the nodes G, D, E, and B, and we go through each of these, and it just happens that G is next, and we work out all the distances from G, and you know, there'll just be one more. And D and E, we've already set as one, so we don't need to worry about those, uh, they've already been put in the queue. But F and H, we now put them in our queue. The front of the queue is D, so we then do the whole process again with node D, and then the next thing in our queue is E, and so we repeat, and it happens that we've already put everything that we visited in the queue, and then B, and we repeat, and now we add C, and then finally H, except that H is our target note, so we can just finish there. And that means that the shortest distance from A to H was 2, and there are various ways of then going back and working out that the actual path we took was A, G, H, but we found the shortest path. And you probably want some kind of proof that this works on every graph and not just the one we've picked, but uh, an easy way to look at it is that we go starting with all the ones that are zero from our start node, and then all the ones that are a distance of one, which we'll have already found, because you know, if they're a distance one, from the start node, then we would have found them after one cycle. And then we go to the ones that are a distance two. And because we've already looked at all the ones that are a distance one, we must have covered them by this point. And then that repeats uh, for higher and higher values until we know that if we've got to a certain one, then we've looked at all the previous nodes that have a shorter distance. And so this must be the shortest distance. So now we get on to the main problem, however this time the weights no longer all have a value of 1. So we again start, we initialize them all with an infinite value, and then we set the value of a to be 0. Then you know we repeat, we work out the distances, put them in a queue, and keep going until we get to h, and then we stop. And that means the distance to h is 42, except that it hasn't worked because we can quite clearly see that if we'd gone instead of a g h, if we'd gone a b f and then h, we could have found a shorter path. So there's something wrong with our algorithm, and we should tweak it so that we can come up with a better solution. Fortunately, all the work we've done so far is not in vain, and we don't have to start again from scratch. Of course, as always, we start by initialising all the distances as a very large number, set the distance from A to A at 0, and our first step is exactly the same of looking at all the neighbours. However, this time, instead of putting them in a queue, we put them in a priority queue. And uh, if you're just interested in how that works mathematically, we always take the minimum value now that we haven't yet fully explored and so I've coloured them in orange and we take our smallest orange node turn it green so now it's being processed and we then look at all its neighbours again and we can know that because all the weights are positive that the next one will be higher and we don't have to worry about A that we've already visited and 
we can see that this means that the distance to E is now slightly shorter. And that's the minimum. So we take E again and we repeat by propagating outwards and making all the ones smaller that we can. And we keep going. until we get to h. And you can see this time that we've worked out the distance is 32. And as I said, there are many ways of going backwards and finding what that path was. But uh, you should see that it's a, b, e, d, g, and then h. So we now have a successful algorithm. And again, you'll probably want a proof that it works. But again, because we're going up in increasing order, so we start with the ones 0, and then one if there are any, and then two if there are any, and so on. And in this case, it was nine as the first one. And then we know, you know, because we're adding only positive values to our weights, that the distances to the next nodes must be higher. And we keep going, and we can guarantee that we'll go past all our nodes in increasing order of distance from the start node until we end up getting to H or our destination. So as we've seen, Dijkstra's algorithm is good, but there is one clear disadvantage. And you can see that being illustrated with this grid setup. And uh, as I leave it going, you can kind of see that it's not really moving very closely towards the goal. It's just spreading out in a fan-like shape because it's doing everything in increasing order of distance from the starting node. And while this means that it will give us a perfect result, it does mean that it's going to take a very, very long time. And you can see that on a larger map, where well, we just want to get from London to Brighton, we work out all the ways to get to these random places like Watford, Slough, Tunbridge. And of course, there's the occasional useful place that we might pass on our route, like Crawley. But... Uh, there really are just so many other places that we work out that we don't need to know. And it really slows down this algorithm's performance as if we're just cycling to Brighton. We don't really need to know all the other details. So of course, if we're going to come up with a better algorithm, we've got to look at what we're currently doing and then try and improve it. So we start with this function, f of n. And this is the thing we're trying to minimize. And currently it's equal to g of n, which is the distance from the start node to where we are. And at each iteration, we pick the one with the smallest value of this function. But the way we can improve this is by instead setting f of n to g of n, the distance, plus h of n, which is some heuristic value that we pre-calculate on all of our vertices. And it doesn't matter what this heuristic value is, as long as the heuristic of a given node is less than the distance between that and every other node, plus the heuristic of the other node. So to illustrate that with an example, we have two nodes, x and y, and f of x is the distance to x plus its heuristic, and f of y is the distance to y plus its heuristic. But we can then write the distance from the start to y in terms of the distance between x and y and the distance to x by just adding them. And then as we know that the heuristic value must satisfy the equation above, and of course remembering to get our inequalities the right, right way around, we now know that f of y is more than or equal to g of x plus h of x, and of course that's just the value evaluated at x. And so, like in Dijkstra's algorithm, this means that at each iteration, the value of f of x, the thing that we're trying to evaluate, is increasing. And so our algorithm is going to work by going through things with a smaller distance first, and then a larger distance, and so on. So you're probably wondering, how do I pick the heuristic value if it's got to satisfy this constraint? And if you remember, the values of f of a node must be increasing, so we can just set it 
to any value that's shorter than the distance between that node and the end. And of course, if we do this in some uniform way, then we know that our algorithm will work. And so one thing we could do is just set it to zero, but then we're just running Dijkstra's algorithm with this additional cost of calculating heuristics. And it's quite common in real world scenarios to just set it to the Euclidean distance, that is the shortest straight line distance. And that works because you know that there's always going to be a way from where you are to the end that's more than or equal to the Euclidean distance. And on a grid, there's a neat trick that you can set it to the Manhattan distance. And technically with the diagonals, there might be shorter paths, but uh, this will cancel out. And so if we run our A star algorithm that's adapted on this new graph, then we end up with a much quicker result. Now we can go back to our original problem and it turns out that the A star algorithm is only going to work out a few of the points on the way. And you can see that this is a lot more efficient and while you know not all of them are going to be on our route, it's at least going to find us a shortest path. So now we can cycle from London to Brighton without having to put in any extra effort. As someone who has a channel that makes videos about how to code in Python, I thought it made sense to include Python code for all of these algorithms. So we'll start with the bread first search, and for that we need a queue. However, Python doesn't have one by default, so from queue, which is a built-in Python library, we need to import a simple queue. And then we'll just create our simple queue and put zero, which is the distance, and the start. And then while the queue is empty, not empty, that means we've got more nodes to visit. And we'll say that the distance and the node are the top. And if we visited that node, because uh, we might end up putting stuff in the queue multiple times, then we'll continue. And now we know we've definitely visited the node, so we set that to true. And if uh, the ID of our node is the target, then that means we finished, so we'll break, and maybe you want to print the distance or whatever. And then for all of the nodes we want to go to in the node's neighbors, we're going to put the current distance, which you remember here is the distance of the current node, plus one, and that new node. And as you can see, it's very simple, a few lines of code, but that's a breadth first search. So now we need to modify our breadth first search so that it works for Dijkstra's algorithm. And so the first thing is that we don't want a simple queue, we want a priority queue. And we'll change that here as well. And now it's going to select the one with the smallest first value, which means the shortest distance to it. And everything is fine up until here. Well, we also want to get the weight. Obviously, this depends on how your node.names is structured. And rather than adding one, we just add the weight to the new node. And that's it. Now we want to modify Dijkstra's algorithm so that we have the A star algorithm. Unfortunately, there's not too much to do. This time, instead of getting distance in our queue, the thing we're minimizing is the score, or f of x. So we'll, we'll put that there. And the distance is the score minus the node's heuristic value. Because, of course, this is just a rearrangement of the formula. And then here, the only thing we want to change is that we then add on the heuristic value of the new node. And that's it. And just a few minor changes means that our code should run a lot quicker as long as we have a good heuristic value.